Hello, we're at Bio Europe 2019 in Hamburg. Uh, it's the 25th edition of, of, of the meeting. And I'm joined by David Thomas, who's the uh, Vice President of uh, Industry Research at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. So, uh, David, at the plenary session, um, you sort of introduced some, you know, pretty interesting sort of, you know, data and information about where the industry uh, stands at the moment. Um, and you know, some of it is, is pretty exciting and optimistic, but some of it is also fairly challenging, particularly around sort of that policy and regulatory space. So do you, do you fancy recapping you know, what, what those yeah, dangers sure. are? I think that first and foremost is on the policy front is, is the issue of drug price controls yeah. in the United States. And we've seen um, different forms of that from the administration, from the Senate, from the uh, House of Representatives, and they're all converging right now, mm -hmm. and they hope to put together a, a package by the end of the, the year. Um, but the, the regulation there, uh, potential regulation, is to have the drug prices in the United States reference to drug prices here in Europe and in Japan, and we think that's quite a bad idea. Um, and so we, we think that they're in terms of an impact, we're starting to see somewhat of an impact in the public markets where we see the biotech index down 13% over four and a half years when we started to have the first conversations um, in the first election about drug pricing. And things have gone up and down, but really never recovered back to those uh, 2015, 2016 uh, highs. Um, and that's compared to the broader index, which is up 45%. Uh, including healthcare, if you take out healthcare, it's actually up 70%. So everyone else is going up, biotech's been uh, down yeah. over that time period. And I think it's a, a, a policy cloud. And, and yeah, unfortunately, I mean, there's a political consensus there. I mean, it's the one thing that yeah. US Republicans and US Democrats seem to agree on. Yes, there, there, there are differences, subtle differences, yeah. but they all agree that something should be done. Yeah. Um, they don't realize that at this same time frame, you know, we are seeing incredible innovation, record FDA approvals, record number of novel drugs in the pipeline. So the system is actually working um, for innovation, but they're putting that aside. So, so uh, you know, what, what is Bio doing to kind of like sort of, you know, mobilize, I guess, its story to try yeah. and counter this? I, I think it's, it's a lot of advocacy on the Hill, um, discussing with policymakers what our industry is all about some of the, the misconceptions. So for a lot of outsiders, they don't realize that the, the US system, pricing system is very complicated and the drug prices aren't net prices. We have this very complicated re rebate and discount system and even getting through that is you know, a learning curve. Um, and I think that um, in, in, in some of the media and, and some of the politicians take advantage of the fact that they do see these prices increasing but not the net prices. They leave that factor out. And even uh, some of the uh, government reports, um, they don't take that into account. So I think there are multiple levels of, of education that are continue to be ongoing. Um, and hopefully people realize that having a more free market-based pricing system is going to be beneficial to innovation in the end. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, it's a similar sort of situation here in Europe. I mean, obviously, the sort of the dynamics are slightly different, but there are still sort of, you know, uh, pricing pressures. Um, and interestingly, the price of the drug actually is a small proportion of the whole, you know, cost of healthcare, um, which is not necessarily right. always fully appreciated. Yeah, in the U.S., I think it's about 10, 10 to 14 percent are the yeah. estimates. Yeah. And so we have other costs like surgeries, hospitalizations that have gone up and up and up, which don't have the benefit of drugs, which have a half-life. They have this generic drop at some point. So, so have you guys modeled what would happen if this, um, you know, what is proposed actually goes ahead? I mean, yeah, the most, what, what's the impact? The most extreme plan is, is the, the plan HR3 from the House of Representatives, and that uh, could potentially hit 250 drugs uh, over the next 10 years. Um, and that would be um, potentially from the CBO estimates, the Congressional, uh, Congressional Budget Office estimates that 10 to 15 drugs over the next 10 years, but that's likely a, uh, an underestimate yeah. because that's looking at 10 years. And some of the companies that are just starting off right now with great innovations are gonna take 10 to 20 years. Yeah. And 
there is going to be less capital going into those companies. And so it, it could be you know, another zero on the end of that if you look at the longer time frame. So it would be devastating to, to innovation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, there's clearly a potential existential threat to that. Right. You know, and, with and, and even a, in a more near term, um, if it's a hit to revenues, whether you're a Japanese company, a European company, and you have a lot of sales in the United States, um, most of these companies will fix their R&D expenditure based on their revenue at 18%, 20%, and that means less R&D, which means less money for the partnering activities, so there might be less beneficial deal terms here or less deals overall, which impacts everyone here at, at this event. Sure, sure. And, and yeah, we, we know how interconnected it all now is. Yeah. The, um, you sort of said that there were sort of like your two policy uh, sort of issues that we're facing. So one yep. was obviously the drug pricing, yep. and the second? The second is going to affect more of the private companies and the venture capital investment flows. And in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of investment coming from overseas in, into U.S. companies. But in 2018, uh, there was an expansion of an old program called CFIUS, or the Committee of Foreign Investment into the United States, and they expanded uh, the regulation to include um, biotechnology as one of these core areas um, that needs to be governed for national security purposes. And they launched a pilot program about a year ago. And so what companies have to do now, if they have uh, foreign investment, in particular in venture capital where you might have a board seat, you have to go through an application and review process, which can take months, and hire a legal firm, uh, a law firm, and pay a lot of legal fees um, on top of that. And so it's starting to slow things down, and we've seen uh, a couple of investments not go through because one of the key components of, the, of a deal was this outside foreign investment. And our venture capital numbers, we usually run at the beginning of the year, and we use multiple databases and compile it together. But just looking preliminarily, we see investment down 20% in venture capital. Yeah. We actually see it going up in Europe, yeah. where you don't have that policy. Um, so already we're starting to see early signs that it could be impacting um, a venture capital. Yeah, I think we're seeing some, maybe some of that sort of uh, you know, Asia money actually being diverted into sort of European opportunities. Yeah, and we're reading about that from uh, individual investors that they're saying we're going to be looking at Europe yeah. instead of the United States if this uh, continues. And just last month they expanded uh, the review to incorporate companies working on genetic data of patients, if you have genetic data stored on your server, you would also be under this, uh, potentially under the rules oh, and regulations. Right. So that is pretty much everyone working in cancer and rare disease where you need some type of uh, genotyping. So what are the opportunities of sort of winding this back? I mean, because as you say, we're already seeing you know, some impact and of course it might be extended because of the... Yeah, well the rules extension. aren't finalized yet. So these are um, a pilot programs and the government is trying to find out where to draw the line. and. Bio's role is to have conversations with Treasury and the Commerce to identify, you know, how broad this is and maybe where that scope could be narrowed. Um, there, there are certain areas that have legitimacy, and we understand their their concerns. And, and is, the, is, is the message, you know, is it resonating with some other politicians? I mean, are, yeah. are they getting it? Right. Yeah, they are. It just it takes time. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> to sort of end on a some more optimistic note. Um, you also presented data uh, around uh, sort of the deal making uh, deal making trends, and there was some, uh, I guess, some good news uh, for, for, for the sector. Yeah. So with uh, respect to licensing, most people here are looking for out licensing from small companies to large. Uh, we have 126 licensing deals so far this year, and that's on par where we were last year. So it's going to be a strong year. And when we look at the aggregate upfronts coming into the industry, it's, it's a record, all-time record. Uh, we're already at 12 billion, likely to be at 13 billion by the end of the year. Last year was uh, 9 billion in aggregate. And the caveat there is that there were some massive deals this year that drove that number up. Um, but to, to see those types of deals for, for small companies, it's, it's a pretty exciting time. I mean, yeah, I mean, although you sort of say there was some um I guess, marquee events in that. Yeah. It still meant there was money going in, in, into the sector. Yes. Um, and, you know, sort of, you know, looking at sort of the actual M&A activity, because, yeah. you know, licensing is one of the, uh, I guess, sort of, uh, what fuels the industry. But also, 
you know, a lot of investors are, are in the space in the hope that there will be some sort of trade sale. So on the M&A front, how does that look? So on, on the acquisition side for smaller companies that don't have a drug approved, yeah. it's actually a down year. Um, so a lot of those will be the private venture capital back. There hasn't been as much activity there and, and no deal over $5 billion, which the prior year we had seen three of those. Um, that's kind of a down year for the R&D stage companies for acquisitions. But when we look at market stage companies, and these are companies that have had a recent approval, likely over the last five years, just getting off the ground with commercialization, that's where the activity is. And we're seeing a very strong year with Two companies, well over five billion, um, and one company just under five billion, um, and more deals than we saw uh, last year. Yeah, yeah, and the the sort of the the areas that that's in is it is it still sort of really focusing on oncology? It's it's cancer and rare disease. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, the two biggest deals were in in cancer, yeah. and uh, the gene therapy, this the Spark Roche deal was. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. And you know, as we look to you know, 2020, um, you sort of say that you've already been looking at the numbers. Do, uh, are, are you looking optimistically to 2020, or? Are we going to have to manage our expectations? I think that from, it depends which area you're looking at, but for acquisitions, I think that's going to continue. Yeah. I think that there are some incredible companies out there that have modalities and IP that pharma does not have, and they're going to continue to go after that. And if it's de-risked, you know, even, even more so. Um, and then looking earlier on, one trend we've seen over the last three and a half years is going into preclinical yeah. companies that have these uh, typically protein modalities, um, antibody-like fragment uh, proteins, and the gene therapies, and the antisense, and the RNAIs, uh, those are all in high demand. And we haven't, we've seen a little bit of a slowdown this year, but I think that there's enough volume there that the pharma wants to get a hold of the, um, the platforms. Excellent. Okay, look, well, Dave, thanks very much for coming Thank you. around. So if you enjoyed that video and benefit from some of the insights that were available, why don't you subscribe to the channel? Uh, and then you can ensure that you don't miss any you know, upcoming uh, videos that we have.